So we're going to talk about how one might reduce negative externalities through information nudges. So we'll first define externalities and give some examples. Uh, we'll then move to social comparison theory and talk about an example where one can reduce negative externalities through information nudges. So what is a, an externality? It is either a cost or a benefit of any activity or transaction to a third party who's not directly involved or engaged in that activity or transaction. So here are some examples uh, where one agent's value depends on another agent's activity. So let's first consider the situation about milk. This is actually not true for milk in the sense that the value of your milk is the same whether or not someone else drinks milk. So we say that milk is a private good and it does not impose externalities on other people's consumption. Now the second example is pollution. Uh, let's take the example of a stream. So if people are dumping, some people uh, are dumping toxins into the stream, then the value of the stream for everybody else who use that stream is decreased. So pollution in that case imposes a negative externality on everyone who uses that stream. The third one is traffic. So the value of the car or your own driving experience depends on how much congestion others create in their commute. So congestion definitely imposes a negative externality on everybody on the road. Now I'm going to separate positive and negative externalities. So positive externalities essentially refer to situations where an external benefit is involved. That an external benefit is a benefit that an individual firm confers on others without receiving compensation. So examples include getting a flu shot or getting vaccinated. If you take the action to get a flu shot, um, that reduces your likelihood of getting a flu and, you know, that reduces, let's say, the viruses that you cough into the air that might cause other people to become sick. So getting a flu shot is a positive external, imposes a positive externality on other people. When positive externality is involved, it turns out that the free market in equilibrium undersupply the activities that impose um, positive externalities. So this is where Either the government can intervene or we can use nudges to get people to do more. The other side is negative externalities, uh, which involve an, an, an external cost. So an external cost is an uncompensated cost that an individual or firm imposes on others. So for example, air pollution imposes an external cost on people who breathe th dirty air. Texting while driving is dangerous, and now it is the leading cause of teen death. So um, unsafe driving imposes a negative externality to uh, everyone um, who are driving on the road. Um, so when negative externalities are involved, the free market tend to oversupply activities imposing negative externalities compared to the efficient amount. Um, this is where either the government need to get involved or individuals or nonprofits need to think about nudges or other interventions to reduce the negative externalities. And so in general, we say that markets cannot solve the problems of externalities because the free market cannot make the agents, the economic agents who are involved in these activities to internalize these externalities. So now before we move into an example of using information nudges to reduce negative externalities, I'm first going to go through a theory by psychologist uh, Festinger 
Uh, it's called a theory of social comparison processes. It turns out that social comparison is a very powerful tool to get people um, to conform to good norms. Um, so Festinger's paper, if you get a chance to read it, is sort of a strange paper because it imposes, it sort of just states a set of hypotheses without testing them or without theoretically deriving them. And, um, but I, I will be just stating his hypotheses and add a little bit of uh, explanation. In the first hypothesis, he asserts that there exists in the human organism a drive to evaluate his opinions and his abilities. So basically, people have the drive to evaluate themselves. And the second hypothesis talk about when that happens. So to the extent that objective non-social means are not available, people evaluate their opinions and abilities by comparison respectively with the opinions and abilities of others. In other words, when do people resort to social comparison? That's when the situation is ambiguous. Um, there is no objective or well-known, well-established norms. The third one talk about uh, with whom do we compare ourselves to? In other words, who are the comparison targets? Uh, and the hypothesis says that the tendency to compare oneself with some other specific person decreases as the difference between his opinion or ability and one's own increases. In other words, the comparison target should be other people who are similar to yourself. So the target should be similar others. Uh, one of the applications that lots of people should be familiar with is recommender systems. So when you buy a book from Amazon, the recommender systems would say, customers who bought A Beautiful Mind also bought The Turing Machine and this, this, this book. So the idea is, you know, the fact that you guys all bought this book, A Beautiful Mind, indicate that there's some common interest. So this is how Amazon's algorithm infer um, that you are somehow similar and make its recommendation that way. And I'm skipping a bunch of hypotheses which I think are not so useful. Um, the, the seventh hypothesis is about comparison group. So uh, Festinger says that any factors which increase the importance of some particular group as a comparison group for some particular opinion or ability will increase the pressure toward conformity concerning that ability or opinion within that group. Okay. Um, so we're going to, the, these hypotheses seem quite dry, um, but we're going to operationalize it. Uh, lies, uh, we're going to operationalize these um, hypotheses in various experiments. Uh, more recent developments in social psychology uh, also talked about, you know, why people do comparison and the efficacy of various types of social comparison. So for instance, Upward comparisons are used when people try to seek self-improvement, and downward comparisons tend to lead to subjective happiness. So the social comparison is a large literature, and in fact, you have encountered at least one example of social comparison in um, 631, uh, when we talked about the uh, difference in differences estimators. And that context of the diff and diff, the data set that you played with, was a social comparison experiment that was conducted on movie lens. So now um, I'm going to present a, a com an example. Okay, so you should have read this paper on Peruso. And so I assume that you're familiar with at least the main idea of this, uh, of this paper. And this is also the data set used in this paper is also going to be your first homework assignment. Um, so this is a paper on social comparison status and driving behavior. And um, I worked on this with a colleague, uh, Fang Wen Lu from Renmin University and Jinan Zhang, who was a student at Stanford at the time. Um, so this idea of this paper is um, to think about whether we can use data and information to extract effective uh, social comparisons to reduce negative externality. And the context is traffic violations.
The decade that just ended um, between 2011 and 2020 was declared as the decade of action for road safety. Um, in 2010, 1.24 million people was killed on the road. It was the eighth leading cause of death globally, and it will become the fifth leading cause of death by 2030. Middle-income countries were the hardest hit. So uh, middle-income countries uh, account for about 80% of the road deaths, but they only have 50% of the world's registered vehicles. So the World Health Organization made uh, several recommendations. So for instance, um, that countries should increase road capacities. Um, they should impose stricter road safety laws increase penalty for driving, uh, drinking and driving, um, increase the use of seat belts, helmets, and, and child restraints, or improve the uh, post-crash responses. These are, you know, good recommendations, but they're expensive. So what we decided to do is to look at information interventions um, and essentially utilize social comparison theory that we just discussed. So we're going to look at within-group comparisons. We're also going to look at between-group comparisons. So this um, essentially tap, taps into social identity theory and status. So we conducted this experiment in China. I'm going to give a little bit of uh, a background information. So about the uh, private car ownership in China. So China had seen rapid increases in private car ownership. So the annual growth rate in recent years was 24% per year, and it's projected to overtake the United States by 2030 in terms of the, the number of private cars. The social norms regarding driving was not quite established uh, at the time of our experiment. So that's where um, social comparisons potentially could be effective. Um, and another interesting fact that we took into consideration in our experiment design was that cars are considered as status symbols. Um, it is a symbol of stability and maturity and in some ways uh, marriageability. So the research questions we ask in this uh, project is uh, what types of social information are effective in reducing traffic violations and who are influenced by status in intergroup comparisons? Uh, I'm also going to discuss a little bit about the um, data analysis techniques. So the field context is the city of Qingdao. Uh, which is a wealthy coastal city in the eastern part of China. Some of you might have heard of Qingdao beer. Um, so it had a population of 8.7 million people, and its per capita GDP is about 2.4 times the national average. Uh, in Qingdao, there were 1.3 million registered cars in 2013, so that's when we worked with the uh, Qingdao Police Department. So we imposed several criteria for the sample selection for our, for our intervention. The first one is that um, they have to be private cars. So that reduced the sample by about 18%. Um, so we, we now have 82% 80, of all the registered cars. We also want that the, the cars are registered with a cell phone number. Uh, so that's 92% of the private cars and that they have to, that the particular cell phone number has to have at least one traffic violations in the first three quarters of 2013, and that's 45% of the sample. So the total sample size end up being 395,204 cars, so roughly 400,000. And the other background that we're going to um, talk about is how traffic tickets are delivered by the Qingdao police. Um, here in North America, if you're pulled aside by a police, there's no way that you somehow weren't aware of it. 
So, but in Qingdao, it's quite different. So there's extensive use of electronic devices since 2011. So there are, you know, red light cameras, video cameras, uh, virtually at all intersections with traffic lights. So uh, the police department actually does not send traffic tickets to car owners if the violations are detected by electronic devices. So the car owners are also not required to pay fines until inspection time. You know, the inspection time could be biannual, annual, or semi-annual, de depending on your car age. And um, the car owners can find information online or by calling, but usually they, bas they find the information when their cars are up for inspection. So here's our um, experimental design. So our experimental instrument is text messages sent in the name of the Qingdao Police Department. So we collaborated with the police department and um, essentially get access. We had access to their database. So we know how many violations each car had and you know, um, other information about the car. We had one control condition and five treatment conditions. Um, and so the control condition essentially are the drivers who receive no text messages. The five treatment conditions you know, each driver in the, in the treatment, in one of the treatments, would receive two pieces of messages. Um, and I first want to talk about the allocation of the sample between the control and the treatment. Uh, you would notice that the control condition actually had a very large sample. So it's about 320,000 drivers were assigned to control whereas 75,000 were allocated to the five treatments. So recall that in uh, experiment design and analysis, uh, we talked about the power analysis or sample size calculation. Then you want to put most of your observations in the experimental condition that has a larger variance. The other piece of information that would be useful is whenever you conduct social comparison experiments and you send out information about the norm, people's behavior tend to converge to the norm, which means that the treatments are expected to have smaller variance compared to the control condition. Therefore, you want to assign most of your samples to the control condition compared to the treatment. So this accounts for the unbalanced control versus treatment. And so the first piece of information in any text message is essentially establishing authentic, you know, authority and authenticity. So it says, Qingdao Police, your car with license number blah, and this is your real license number, had this many traffic violations in the first three quarters of 2013. The second piece of information is specific to each treatment. So the first information, the first piece, essentially, you know, calls your attention because it comes from the police. And um, it talks about your license number, so you know this is not spam, and that it has, it tells you about hopefully new information, which is the number of traffic violations that you have had. So the second piece of information uh, is really specific to the treatments. So in the own ticket treatments, we wrap up by saying, Qingdao police, please drive safely for the sake of yourself and others. So we can think of that as exhortation, just do the right thing. And we also have a treatment called own brand treatment, where the Qingdao police said, your car brand had an average of this many traffic violations. Your violations are, you know, depending on what your violation are above, about the same, or below your brand average. And then also wrap up with the same exhortation, please drive safely for the sake of yourself and others. And then we have three status treatments, um, each with about 15,000 observations. So this is about intergroup comparison, but with status built into it. So the high status treatment says, among high-end cars, a brand with few violations had an average of 0.6 violations, which are above or below your brand average. Please drive safely for the sake of yourself and others. And then we have a mid, 
uh, a median status treatment, you know, among middle range cars, you know, 0.6, among low, the low status treatment says among economy cars, you know, the average is 0.6. We did not make these up. Um, it turns out, so we browsed the database and we computed each car brand's average number of violations in that database. And we selected three cars, um, three car brands, which happen to have the same. So this is primarily to avoid any anchoring effect. So the high-end car that we chose was Rolls-Royce. The middle-range car was Skoda, and the economy car was Fukang. So these three cars, we our original intervention says that um, among Rolls-Royce drivers, but then the police uh, didn't want to mention any specific car brand. They didn't want to look as if they were doing advertisements for the brand. So as you will find out when you started to run experiments or A-B tests in your own corporation or nonprofit, that any final experiment design tend to be a compromise between what's desired from the end of the science perspective versus what's feasible. Okay, so the implementation was very quick. It, was, it happened on two days in October 2013. And we are going to derive a set of hypotheses. So this is essentially utilizing the hypotheses uh, or theory from social science theories and experiments and apply them to the specific setting. So compared to the control, drivers have fewer traffic violations after receiving a text message about the average violations of drivers of high status cars. So notice that each driver in our sample has had at least one violation. So 0.6 is less than one. Um, and you know, high status also has, we'll see, has an effect on the, uh, on the um, um, behavior of the drivers. And so the first result is computing the average treatment effect. So this is table four in the, um, in the paper. So what you see here, we, we sort of produce part of table four. What you see here are the treatment dummies on the left-hand side, so the omitted variable was the control condition. So everything you see here looks at how it does relative to the control condition. Um, the left panel is what's called the extensive margin, um, and the right panel are called the intensive margin. So when you evaluate experiments, there, these are two things that we often check. The extensive margin, just look, it's a binary variable. Whether people had violations after um, being treated, and the intensive margin looks at, you know, the number of violations conditional on having at least one violation post-intervention. If you look at the high status treatment dummy, this reports the effect of um, the behavior of the high status drivers compared to the control condition the month after our intervention. So what we find is, you know, you see the negative coefficient that the high status treatment drivers reduce their likelihood of traffic violation by 0.6 percentage points and the number of violations by 5% compared to the control group. So that is the average treatment effect. I'll point out two little things that I'm going to cover later. It's technical. The first one is what is in the square brackets. That is what we call the Q values. So you're all familiar with the P values. What the Q values are, are adjusted for multiple hypothesis testing. Because we're testing more than one hypothesis, we want to adjust for the fact that, you know, we might get statistical significance, significance simply by chance. So this looks at the effect of status. Um, the second hypothesis is intergroup comparison. We look at gender and car status. Um, so this type of analysis is called heterogeneous treatment effect. So we're analyzing subgroups. Hypothesis two says that high, the high status treatment will have stronger influence among male drivers and drivers of economy cars. So how do we know that? 
Um, this is from previous lab experiments that uh, male, male uh, subjects tend to be more influenced by status manipulations. And also for drivers of, of economy cars, because cars, um, cars are a status symbol, we anticipate that drivers of economy cars might be more influenced by this manipulation. Okay, so the second result looks at, you know, gender and car status. So this is what we call heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, and it's from table six of the table of the uh, paper. Um, so the dependent variable is the post-intervention number of violations, V. The independent variables are treatment dummies again, and the omitted uh, variable is the control group. And so we first break out the treatments, um, the effect by gender. We look at male and female. We then look at the cars. Um, so the first two specifications look at, you know, whether gender, whether men and women respond to this, the treatments differently. It turns out that yes, so male drivers of economy cars reduce their likelihood of traffic violations by 1.4 percentage points and their number of traffic violations by 16% compared to the control group. So column two looks at male drivers, column five looks at economy car drivers, and column six looks at male drivers of economy cars. And so the effect size increases, and um, in the end, the subgroup of male drivers of economy cars has a very large uh, reduction. So the third hypothesis look at within brand comparisons. So this is, you know, if you recall Festinger's hypothesis, you know, with whom are we comparing ourselves with? Um, it should be similar others. So the comparison target should be someone who are similar to ourselves. Um, and what you see here in this context, you know, what's similar others, it could just be, you know, people who drive the same car brand. So in the own car, in the own brand treatment, drivers with above average number of violations will decrease their number of violations after receiving the text message from the police. And those who are below average will increase their number of violations after receiving the text message. So this probably sound, sounds familiar because if you recall in the movie lens experiment, we also have this, you know, shrinking, you know, the, the essentially uh, the contraction of the distribution. So people who are above might come down and people who are below went up by a lot. And so except that in the movie rating context, you know, rating a lot of movies is good, whereas in the um, car accident or car violation context, you know, less is better. So what's socially desirable is different in these two, in these two experiments. And so this is your third result, which is the within brand comparison. And we see that um, in columns five and six, the own brand has a um, significant reduction of the average number of violations uh, of those who are above average, which is a good thing because, you know, we want less traffic violations, We're, so, so a, a reduction is, is good. Whereas for the uh, below average, it did not increase um, you know, either statistically or in terms of absolute value, um, there is no perceptible increase. So let me summarize the, uh, the third result, which is the within brand comparison. So drivers with above average number of traffic violations significantly reduce their likelihood of violation by 0.8 percentage points and the number of violations by 6%. Drivers with below average number of violations have similar number of violations as those in the control group, which is good that um, in the sense that they, you know, if, if this manipulation made drivers who, you know, better drivers decide to have more violations, then, you know, the benefit and the cost of the, uh, of the information nudges would just cancel each other out. 
So it's good that only the above average number of drivers came down. So let me summarize what we have found in this um, project. We find that when you, know, when you do within group comparisons, information on the own group average um, should be provided only to those who have above average number of violations. So that's um, a 6% reduction. Um, I also want to say that this actually this result does not survive multiple hypothesis testing correction. Uh, we'll have more on that later. The intergroup comparison result for the status result, we find that high status role model reduces traffic violations of male drivers of economy cars by 16%. So that's a very large reduction. And this result is statistically highly significant, and that it survives multiple hypothesis correction. We looked at the type of violations that the drivers had after they received these interventions. It turns out that most of the reduction in violation, in the type of violations, is in speeding, which point to perhaps attention as the mechanism driving um, the results of the nudges.